Hey, hey, one, two, here we are. See a little bit of choppiness going on here, but otherwise, looks like we're cooking along. Good to have everybody here. Thanks for coming back. Hello, 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 everyone. I think it's hot just about everywhere right now. Hot and sticky from all those folks down there getting that hurricane. First of all, I hope everybody's safe. Um, looks like we're getting some some lag here and there, but we're gonna power through. Um, but uh, good to see everybody. Good to have everybody here in the chat so far. 80 strong, just getting started. Love it, absolutely love it. Again, hope everybody's safe down there. And uh, also, you know, all, please take care of your brothers and sisters during these crazy times. You know, man, if we can do anything, we can just lend a hand. Hopefully we're, we're doing that communally here just by, um, just by hanging out a little bit. Everyone's welcome of, of uh, every size, stature, <laughs> gender, race, religion. You're all welcome here in the stream. We love it. Um, and uh, man, I'm just glad to be here, glad to be safe. Uh, we've had a crazy year so far. Um, yeah, I can't go down there, I'll just get sad, man. I just wanna, I just wanna have fun with you guys today. I don't wanna get sad, I wanna talk about tone. And that's what we're doing, talking about tone today. All right. So um, everybody else, looks like you're all doing good. Everybody's got some good uh, good comments here. Got people from all the way from Spain to Dallas to the UK, Denmark. Oh man, you guys are too good. Um, all right, our good, good news. Our friend Robert has had successful surgery. Fantastic. <laughs> You're referring to Robert Keeley, I imagine. That's uh, wonderful news to hear for sure. Glad that more folks in this industry are staying healthy and well. Um, so, so good to have everybody um, pulling for Robert for sure. He's, he's a pioneer, and when it comes to pedals, man, there's very few that are, well, there's a lot of great people out there, but he's a trendsetter for sure. Um, we're talking about tone today, and then I'm even gonna throw in a little lesson for you. I got a smidge of a lesson. Um, I'll be adding this kind of thing later to YouTube and my True Fire channel and stuff like that. There is, there is a PDF for uh, today's date as well. We'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but I got my sold 67 Princeton here. Got this, my first guitar, real good guitar ever. This was a custom shop Strat when it originated. They didn't make an Ash Body Strat at the time. And it was in, well, I don't want to give my age away. <laughs> I'm kidding. It was in 95. <laughs> And I hated everything about it for years. The neck, the pickups. I just, I just didn't know what I was doing when I ordered it. I was, I was a young, dumb kid. <laughs> um, but I've got a lot of other nice guitars and I've learned and I've just had some conversations recently with some folks about, man, this, it's the quest. We're all on the quest. Like I play each one and I sound like I wanna sound two thirds of the way. And then there's that one third that I wish the guitar could give me what I'm hearing in my head and my hands. And it, it's just a struggle, you know? I mean, <laughs> but that's why it's fun. You know, I mean, I, I imagine people that collect cars are the same way, or, um, I mean, you name it, anything that's like a job slash hobby, you know, uh, whether it's cooking utensils, it can be anything, man, for sure. But the reason I picked up a Strat is this one, the pickups are these Lust for Tone pickups that are really great. Greg at Lust for Tone is a really, really great designer. And, <laughs> They sound very 60s Strat to me. And I don't know, I've had a bunch of different whammy bars. This is obviously not the original. And it makes a bunch of noise all the time. Now my Silver Sky one is killer. That's a really, really killer um, tremolo for sure. But what I'm doing, what you're hearing right now is just, oh, I don't wanna be too adulterated here. I was having some fun. Let me, let me make an adjustment. So this Princeton, 1967, uh, generally this is a 10 inch speaker. And um, lots of times the folks, in, folks and players in Nashville love this amp because it breaks up in a really sweet spot, but that 10 doesn't have quite enough, uh, uh, you know, quite enough um, low end ultimately. So a lot of folks will add at a 12 inch speaker, which is what I did there. That's a 12 inch Alessandro speaker, it's 40 watts. And 
it's the best speaker I've heard for this amp. It's really, really great. Now, that being said, I do love warehouse speakers. I endorse those. I got those in just about every amp cabinet back there, aside from maybe the Marshall. Okay, so then coming into the, the amplifier, let's talk a little bit about what, what we love about amplifiers and tube amps and why I'm using the aux also. I thought about doing a session where we could mic the amp, but it would just get kind of crazy and unwieldy when really the aux is doing such a, a great a great job of replicating um, not only cabinet the cabinet but the um, but the microphones as well. So y'all I even got this hooked up for you. So you can see what I'm seeing here. Very, very cool. I got the aux interface rocking as well as the stream. I mean, I can't believe I'm doing all this. Somebody stop me. So we'll get back to that in a second, but um, let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. So the guitar, I have this little rocket pedal in line here that we're gonna talk about. because that'll be like kind of next level, and it's gonna be very basic. The red light on it just means that it's a buffer, and there's a, what that means is, this is a good pedal to have if you have a bunch of pedals like I do. It kind of helps keep your signal strong throughout it. So that just means the buffer is always on, and it's keeping in the signal from the guitar to the amp nice and strong. And with Fender amps, you know, let's put it where I'll just put the knobs at five right now, the treble and bass. Um, and I like to start somewhere just as the amp starts to open up around three. That's a nice, really big tone. Super clean, but it doesn't take long for that amplifier to start to kind of break up and get distorted. And we'll talk about that too later on. Excuse me. Um, I just changed the reverb tank. The reverb tank broke as will happen, they're cheap. Uh, my good buddy uh, from Two Rock, he sent me a, um, a, a tank that they put in their amps, and man, it is a killer reverb. Check this out. Yeah. It sounds very similar to my Ebo, you know, as far as the decay. So I got the reverb, hooked that up today. I mean, guys, I was up at like 6.30. I fixed the amp. This room was a complete mess. If you've seen any of my posts recently, I've been doing some demos for the QSC company and their QS and their uh, CP8 speakers. The room was completely trashed. There's a bunch of wires right down below me. You can't see, it's insane. So, and then we have, in this amp, we have a great, great tremolo. And this is just, this is, Still 1967 technology. So good. Well, let's turn that off. Okay, and let's talk about what you're hearing. So we'll go back to the aux. So we're coming out of the, um, what happens is with an amplifier, you have an amplifier and then there, there's a, a speaker output and you connect your speaker to that. And the aux, is taking place of the speaker. So you take a wire out of that speaker wire and go right into the aux. Then what I also did just for fun is I went back out of the aux and connected the speaker so that you can actually, I could bring the live speaker in if I wanted to and you'll hear it through my vocal mic. It's probably, probably getting a little loud there. But I'll bring the speaker volume back to zero. Um, looks like because your dog know that you're using your amp. <laughs> Somebody yelled at me and they're like, stop looking at the comments when you're talking. I was like, I like seeing what you guys say. <laughs> they're like, your eyes dart around too much. It's distracting. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's live, I'm trying. Um, cool, so we got a great clean tone there. And if we take a look at the Aux app, let's just make sure we know what we're talking and what we're dealing with here. So what I, what I think is really special about Aux is that, first of all, you see this speaker cabinet looks very similar to, uh, to what I have here. And this is a, a, a model of a 112 inch speaker and it's mic'd with two styles of microphones and I have them blended pretty much the same and they're, they're panned in such a way so they, they create a nice, um, a nice spread. And that's what's happening here. And you can see, I can move these around, I can change the panning and all that. And what you're gonna hear is a big difference. Uh, I didn't really necessarily wanna go this route, but it's important to hear that um, microphones really are like the ears of the studio. And the 414 right here, that's a condenser microphone that really is a pretty classic mic because not only does it 
a condenser mic really hears to me whatever is around it much closer to the human ear. Um, it has a large full range sort of replication. Um, these particularly have a nice low end and it even says in here, depending on the speaker, you may want to use the low cut on the mic channels. And low cut is this button right here, which um, takes some of our low frequencies out and makes the fender a little less tubby. <laughs> which it will get. You'll hear that as I turn the amplifier up. Kind of a classic thing with fenders. Then over here it says Ribbon 160. So this is a ribbon microphone that, um, man, these are really, really classic. Um, it says, used by English based recording engineers to capture loud guitar amps and drums on some of the greatest rock re records of the late 60s. It's got ribbon, the ribbon uh, uh, diaphragm in the microphone is very brittle and you have to be very careful with ribbon microphones, but they have a super nice soft top end. And we can solo them up just so we can hear them. So that's replicating what this amplifier would sound like mic'd with that. So we're blending a real amplifier with, um, with this digital technology. We can hear the 414 on its own as well. Let me solo that up. Nice crystal top end, if we play them together, it makes for a nice fat blended sound. The cool thing about the aux is that when you do that, if you were to do that in a real world situation, if you were to do that in a real world situation, you would get something called phasing. And that's what was also kind of happening because you're hearing the sound coming direct, the sound coming through my microphone, and it sounds like a little bit hollow. That's, that's what happens when your, uh, your elements are out of phase. Okay, so, so you're hearing that amp through that, that mic scenario there, just like that. But let's just for fun, let's hear what different microphones sound like. I'll go back to the aux. And we'll have a listen to kind of a classic design on its own, an SM57. We'll just solo that up. Very direct sounding, very much in your face. Nice mid-range, like it says in the description here, it really cuts through the mix. So let's add the 414 to it. That's super nice. But it's not as soft sounding as the ribbon. So I love ribbon microphones. Now if we were to change maybe to something called the 421 microphone, this is a Sennheiser style microphone. And just go right back to the 57. So it doesn't have the low end. Well, that sounds nice though. We pair that with the 414. I mean, to me, anything with that 414 sounds really good. Um, another great ribbon microphone and one that's kind of classic is the Royer well, as classic as the 160, is the Royer 121. So what happens is a lot of folks in Nashville will take that and pair it with the 57 and get this kind of tone. I mean, you can't get a bad sound. It's really, really pretty great, actually. I mean, that, that combination on its own. I'd be happy with that. But the cool thing is, when you're talking about, um, when you're talking about studio, you know, you have a controlled environment. So you can go ahead and you can get crazy and use maybe a U87 or U67 type microphone and a condenser. Now this is gonna, this is gonna give you a wide, wide, big tone. Really crystal top end. I was just showing you one mic. Let's take them both off. Here we go. There we go. So I like to think of, um, you know, the, the condenser mics as having like this real broad, almost human ear quality to it, whereas the dynamic microphones have uh, more of that punch to them. So let's go back to my original setting real quick here. I'm just going to get it set up while it's off camera. Okay, there we go. Cool. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're just going to slowly start to turn the amplifier up. And this is great because it's such a controlled environment. We're going to be able to kind of hear this amp at all stages. We'll go from one, nothing, 
just my microphone. We'll bring it in. Now we went past three, it really got to three before it did anything. Now what we'll do is we'll get up to about three and a half. And I'm gonna turn this line output down because I don't want to distort your what you're hearing. Still kind of clean, but it's not gonna be clean for long. Now it's getting a little bit on the edge of rock and roll there. And this is what happens with these single channel amplifiers like this. The more you turn them up, the more distorted they get. So let's go to four and a half. Now we're, now we're getting sort of a great rock blues tone. And that's kind of my favorite place to live with Fender amps because I can get a little bit of the... pickup it gets a little bit growly so that's just amp reverb from the amp and the speaker simulation okay so I'm really bringing up the speaker simulation because we can't have it in a cranked room with a live feed it would just not work out so let's go even further five and a half and we're gonna start to notice something that's happening okay do you hear that low end not as defined as maybe some of those higher strings. I'll pull the reverb back a little bit. So it's starting to get a little undefined there on the lower notes. Still holding in there, but as we push it farther, we're gonna see what happens. We'll go to six. It sounds killer though. I got this guitar, I think I need the nut. You know, I see I just push the string off. I hate when that happens. Okay, but you hear that now? I'm gonna take the bass, I'm gonna turn the bass all the way off. There's videos of, in commentary from a lot of session players in town here, where when they record, they record with the bass knob all the way down because in the mix, the mixing engineer will end up taking so much of that low end out that it doesn't matter. And if you're playing this kind of stuff. we're still playing through the amp no pedal it's not even on <laughs> so let's keep going up let's see what we get so we turn the low end down because what happens is remember we talked I was saying that I would mention it um, fender amps are known to getting to get really loose in the low frequencies as you turn them up now what has happened over the years is that people love that tone but they don't want that sort of loose bottom end some people really dig it you know um, and what happens is over the years, whether it be through modifications or through companies like Two Rock or, you know, you name the boutique company out there, Bogner, Rivera, I mean, there's, there's millions of them. Um, they, the reason they're all kind of like crafting something off of this platform is because it is great, but it's got flaws. And I was thinking about this today as I was putting uh, the reverb tank in it, like I don't know my way around it inside of an amp at all, but I could put a reverb tank in it, it's just a couple wires. And I thought to myself, man, these things are like old Chevys. You know, I mean, that's why people like old cars because you can get in and buy parts and you can fix carburetors and change spark plugs and all that kind of stuff, you know? So, so there we are, sounds great. I might even turn the treble up a little bit more because what happens is another thing I love about these style of amplifiers, as you turn the amp up, you're, you're sending the signal through what's called the tone stack.
and the tone stack is introducing more gain as you turn treble and bass up. So we can play around with that in a minute too, but we'll go, we'll go all up to seven. I mean, it's, that's rock and roll. We got let's go to eight and it just keeps getting more distorted from there but a lot of us like that low end to be intact which, which it's clearly not here and what the heck let's turn it up to 10 see what we get but hey, that's what you get. So we, what can also happen is you take a guy like a Johnny Winter and he might turn his treble all the way up to 10, turn the gain. And that treble kind of rounds out that woofy low end. So the bass is on zero or one, treble's on 10. It sounds really good. And the cool thing is, because of aux, and I'm not just doing an aux commercial, I've done plenty of those. <laughs> I love this thing because I can do that and get all of this sound out of this amplifier like, like it's supposed to be. Um, but let's talk about incorporating some pedals into that so that we can get like a multi-tiered level of that because we can't, we can't just go turn our amp up to take a solo, but what a lot of us did back, you know, and, and Hendrix is, you know, one of a uh, gazillion players. <laughs> that would make use of a strap by turning the volume down, you know. And maybe turn it up, let's turn it up a smidge. Turn the volume down, clean it up a little bit. So there you have it. All right, let's go back to four-ish, somewhere around there, and let's uh, let's jump over and have a look and see what you guys are asking me. Because I was really trying to um, really trying to um, keep an eye on the ox and all this other stuff. Um, I'll start from the bottom and go to the top. Um, let's see here, Jason Carter, good to have you. Ron Peterson, good to have you. Awesome, good to see you guys. Um, Jason says he'd love to hear a heavy delay with that tone. We could do that too, for sure. Um, let's see here. Uh, thanks, Ron, for always working in my courses, my friend. Um, thanks so much, uh, Sussy180. I see you here and on Instagram. I appreciate your support. Dan Gormley says, Blackface amps are the bomb. Absolutely, it's my Desert Island amp. This is my single most Desert Island amp. <laughs> And we could talk to my buddies at Two Rock and they would agree. They'd be like, yeah, we think it is too. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, what else? Jason says, welcome back to the hat. I just did a photo shoot with a friend of mine and I wore this hat and I was like, this thing looks pretty cool. I'm gonna keep wearing it. Um, if you turned your basement up like that, the walls would come down in my house. <laughs> yeah, it, it would, but you know, thankfully this box allows me to do that. So we're both hearing it. Uh, I'm hearing it through my ears. You're hearing it through my speakers. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Martin Diehouse asks, Hey, Corey, are there any classic sounds or records you keep in mind or ear when dialing in your sound? It depends on the style of music. Um, I always let the style of music sort of guide me. Uh, for the most part, excuse me, what's great about these amplifiers, they take pedals so well, and we'll talk about that, 
that if I use this as my sort of palette or my blank slate, if you will, I can start to add pedals to it and of any variety and manipulate the sound so I could get, you know, that's why pedals exist, so we could get a Marshall sound with a Fender amp, you know, or a Vox sound with a Fender amp or something like that, or a high gain sound at the, at the hit of a button, you know, and we need to do that often because of the situations we're put in musically. So I always kind of start with something like this because I can manipulate it. However, if I just had that Marshall, I could make it work too for a variety of things. However, most of the things I've had to play in my life, this kind of single ch channel Fender has worked quite well. Um, so yeah, um, however, I've owned Vox style amps. I had Dr. Z's that were great. Um, and they were Vox type amps. Not all of them, just the models that I had. Um, so that's kind of my, my goal there, is to kind of kind of start with the blackface sound. But it's, you asked about records. Um, oh man. Um, it's tough to say specifically record-wise. Um, I think when I listen to records, I kind of I hear inherently like what tone they're going for. Um, or what piece of gear they're using. They're using some kind of Fender type sound or some Marshall type sound or something and I, I try to gravitate towards that. So I can't think of one specifically, but um, because if you think about it, you know, up in, you know, in the golden age, early days of rock and roll, it was Fender, Marshall, Vox, maybe, uh, you know, amplifiers that were like, oh, like a Supro or uh, Selmer, things like that. Um, but they all kind of, they kind of went in and out of their own technology and, and kind of copied each other to a degree. Um, Jim C, did I miss your birthday? Happy birthday, man. Sorry that you uh, were having a party that no one could attend. I've heard a lot of that happening at this, in this year. Um, let's see here. So yeah, everybody wish a happy birthday to Jim C. Um, Eric says that clean tone is great. I think it is. That's why I love this amplifier for recording. It's just awesome. So uh, have we found a cheaper alternative to the aux yet? Um, not with the flexibility that aux has, and also aux doesn't use impulse responses like a lot of other things do. Um, we did talk about the Strymon Iridium on a recent broadcast. This in the digital world for the money has been a really, really great sort of mousetrap. Um, but with, when it comes to load boxes and stuff, there, is, there are some other things out there, but you don't have the sort of flexibility um, that Aux gives you. And the reason it's expensive, by, you know, let's just, let's just say that it is, it's an expensive load box, sure. Um, a lot of folks would say that. But if you, the microphones I was, sort of going back and forth in alone are at least twice the price of what an aux is. So the, the concept is that they've done all the work for you and that's what you're paying for. You're paying for the cabinet modeling, the, the microphone modeling. We haven't even talked about trying different cabinets with amplifiers and hearing what it sounds like because I just wanna let's say, let's say, let's assume we all have something like this and we wanna start to add some pedals to kinda to mix it up a little bit. So um, there are some other things out there that are reactive load boxes but probably not as um, true to the ox's, uh, to what the ox delivers. Ron says he's been messing with his pod H500 for weeks, haven't played my Fender Blues Jr. Um, deep dive into it, have fun, Ron. Um, let's see here, and uh, Kreenar, Siku Guitar, what are you using to monitor the ox output? I'm listening in my in-ear monitors right here, it's coming out of my Universal Audio Apollo. Um, Greg Newton just got his white maple silver sky. Awesome. <laughs> That's killer. Um, Ron, I'm not telling you how old I was in 95. <laughs> Let's see. And then you guys were just kind of... Uh... Well, Jason said tone for his, him is an issue. My guitar looks great, but the tone isn't great. Um, well, it depends on what you're plugging it into, I guess. Lots of other love for the courses. Thanks so much, guys. Um, and just uh, a lot of other well wishes there. Um, Jeff McElane joining the, joining the chat. Everybody say hello to Jeff McElane. Good friend. I'll call him a mentor because he's so much older than me. <laughs> but uh, Jason says, uh, 
Jason says, where's Jason? Is there a cheaper alternative to the Fender Princeton? Would the Fender Frontman or Fender Champion be good? Um, they're solid state amps, so they're not gonna really be as comparable. Um, however, uh, you might wanna look at, at, a, at a, a secondhand Blues Junior. That would be my, my next best choice. Um, definitely, definitely Blues Juniors. I love them, I've had several of them. Can I play metal on the amp? I could play metal if I plugged in, um, if I plugged in a distortion pedal, but yeah, see it doesn't, that low end again doesn't allow for much of, much of the genting. I can maybe. That's about as metal as it gets on the Fender Princeton on 10. Yes. Okay, uh, let's see who else is jumping in here. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Blues Jr. for sure. Yeah, even more, Adrian says, more flub from humbuckers. <laughs> Jeff says, that's not metal. It's not metal. Um, it's more like rat, which is like, by the way, I got a, I got a, a recommendation on uh, LinkedIn to connect with Stephen Piercy. Oh well. <laughs> hey, David Waldrop made it. Good to see you, man. Thanks for being here. So what speaker am I using? John Wenzel says. John, maybe you got here late. Um, Dave Vistas asks, how do you get the best clean tones from your Fender amp and aux? Um, so let's go back to that and then we'll start talking about some ways to dirty it up. Um, let's see here. So go to my aux app. Where's my software here? Here we go. Here's my aux app. With Fender amps of this variety, I find three to three and a half is just like kind of as far as they go before you get into breakup land. And let's talk about changing some cabinets and really hearing how a speaker cabinet affects your tone. Now that's a 112 inch speaker, which is kind of synonymous with, with guitar tone. But in the aux, we can, we can pair this amplifier with a bunch of different speakers. So let's hear uh, a 110, which is what it would really be. More mid-rangey. And these sound really good when you crank them up. sort of um, that real wiry tone that and think about it you went from a 12 inch speaker down to a 10 so the low end is going to change so it definitely got tighter and it even helped us out a little bit there I maybe can add some of that low end back but it got wooly on us already, see? That's what happens. All right, so we could go back to the Aux app and let's go to a, like a Tweed 15 watt cabinet. Lost my reverb there for a second. Here's another sort of Tweed style. Listen to that top end, much more brittle sounding, you know? Yeah. It's crazy, man. Speakers are everything, man. They do so much. What about if we go to like a 210? This is more like a Vibrolux type cabinet. <laughs> I didn't change anything on the amp at all. I mean, just like completely, it's more mid-range honk. All from different speakers. We could go to a 212, like uh, like this is a twin type cabinet here. 
Really tubby. Yeah, fun stuff. Let me change it up. We'll go to, uh, let's see here. Let's do a 410 basement. I'll bring the uh, gain back a little bit here. Let's turn it up. Nice and clean because you got now, now you got, you got 40 inches of speaker, okay? So you got four tens, <laughs> right? And they're super fast reacting speakers. So like you might find those more in a super reverb. And if the amp's kicking there, at, it's on five, you know, that's holding the, the low end together pretty well. That's a nice pairing. However, the top end's a little chimey. But hey, that's just what we're dealing with. We didn't, we didn't change the microphones or anything. We're just changing the cabinets. And let's go to a 412. So now we got a 412 cabinet and this little amplifier. Pretty interesting. Listen to that low end get gnarly. So you can see that there's a lot of options. As soon as you start to mess around with cabinets, that's what happens. Okay, so we'll go back to our original setting there. All right, so before we get into the chat again, let's go to about three and a half, four, where we were before. And what I'm going to do, adjust my output settings here. This little pedal right here is called the Steampunk. It's a buffer boost from Rocket Pedals. If they still have these out on the market, they're like 99 bucks. And it's killer because that red light is a buffer. So the, the buffer is always making our signal strong. We talked about that. And then here is the, the boost for the, uh, the clean boost. So if I kick it in, not much change, right? I like to do that with pedals and get them super close. And then start to turn it up a little bit. And now we're getting a little front end breakup. We turn it off, we're back to the clean machine. And we can kick it in, get a little grind. So it's kind of like we reached over and turned the amplifier up. Now, what if we go back to sort of where we were, we turn the amp up even more. We want to drive that front end. We want to put more signal into that front end with the pedal. So we're going to turn that knob up. And I'm just adjusting my outputs because I send more signal. It kind of will affect you guys and what you hear. Going to bring the bass down. So pretty significant, what happens is you're getting more like saturation and compression happening. Take it off. A little bit of a volume jump, but more importantly, kind of a compression jump. So that's sort of like the first place you can go when it comes to adding a pedal to your rig. That's what often you hear referred to as a clean boost nowadays because we're kind of just taking that clean tone and we're boosting it. And I like to set mine, lots of times I'll set it barely pushed at all, but I just want a little bit more fullness than what I'm used to. So I might like the tone that this gives me, but with the pedal, gives me somewhere in between turning the amp up and turning the pedal up. Because if I was at four, it's not bad. I can go a little farther. Now I get a little too much break up, but now I get the pedal on. And now I can have some play with my volume control. Yeah. See that freaking string falls off again. See, 
that's a nice sound overall right there. And then what I would probably do is add more overdrive pedals so that I could have more cascading gain and more fu flexibility. <laughs> So that's just what like a simple $100 pedal can do. Like so if you have an amp like a Blues Junior or a Pro Junior, that's another one, Jason. That's a good one. Um, and then you could add maybe a reverb pedal to it or something or something like that. But what we can do, and then we can do this shortly or whatever, I'll ask, answer some questions first. But um, we can start adding some more drive pedals to the mix. Like this is a Greer Lightspeed. This is kind of a cool pedal. This is the Rockaway Archer from Rocket where it's kind of like a clean boost meets um, a Klon style drive with a graphic EQ, kind of a cool thing. Um, this is the good old Tim Pierce. I didn't realize I had so many rocket pedals here today. The Tim Pierce overdrive, which gives us a boost and drive, um, and the clean boost in this is really, really gorgeous. It, sound, it sounds really nice. Um, so I've been playing around with that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've been doing. Um, some other things I've been doing that's fun too. I'll talk to you about that too, but let me jump over to the chat. You guys rule. First of all, it's great to be back with my man BB Ninja, rocking the links for us. Thank you so much, my friend, for doing that. Thanks for bearing with me last week. Thanks everybody for bearing with me as well last week. Um, and I'll tell you why in a minute here. Oh, I wet my whistle. Um, so I was recording two courses with, uh, with Eric Andreas from Your Guitar Sage, and we're doing like some from the stuff from the ground up, like I'm starting to kind of overhaul a lot of things where I'm want, I want like, you know, as you grow as a teacher, you start to develop new, new ways to elaborate on things or convey a message. And I'm doing a beginner blues rhythm course and an intermediate blues rhythm course that really are companions of each other. And I was shooting a couple days a week in his studio and um, man, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do a live stream. I did one after I, uh, I shot, and that was the one on the Strymon, and, and I was just so exhausted during that, you guys probably could tell. <laughs> and I was like, I can't do it again. Can't let my people down. Um, okay, uh, so David Waldrop says, my deluxe has been very sad since COVID volume hasn't been above four. That is too, too bad. Um, all right, so Ron's taking the cover off his Blues Junior. Okay, so Ron, with your Blues Junior, what you can do with that amplifier, which is really cool, is you can um, please play around with the volume and the gain. Now, what you can do is if you want a big clean sound like that, turn the volume knob all the way up, okay? And then the gain sort of, the gain knob becomes your volume, okay? And that what happens is the amplifier has a preamp and a power amp. And if the volume is all the way up, that means that the power amp is kind of doing all of its work. It's working super hard. And as the gain knob go, gets turned up, that becomes almost your volume in a sense. It's kind of like what's happening here. There's no master volume on this. Your master volume is on a Blues Junior. Um, and any other amp that has a master volume, that's kind of what happens too. So a master volume was really developed so that you could um, turn the master down and turn the gain up so you could get more front end distortion and then sort of control it almost like a valve. Think of a master volume like a master water valve. And if the master valve is all the way open, that, that stream is strong, okay? Now, if you turn it down, it's gonna sort of not, and you went to you know, turn your faucet off, fa your faucet on in the bathroom, it's gonna trickle out. You know, and it's going to be more compressed stream, right? Compressed tone. But if you go and you crank that that water back open, you're getting a nice, powerful stream. So you're getting everything that that uh, stream allows, and that's what I like about amplifiers like this, or that have a single uh, or have a master volume. The first thing I do is turn that master all the way up because I want to hear how it responds to my playing. And that's what's cool about an aux is it's it's attenuating your preamp and your power amp. A lot of other products out there that are attenuators are using a digital power amp and attenuating the front end. So you're not really getting a true representation of your tone. That's, that's the story, I'm sticking to it on that. So on Blues Junior type amp, turn the volume all the way up and then the gain knob is your volume. Then what you could do is, what I would do is, there's a, like, they call them chicken head knobs, just take those knobs and start to bring them back to maybe like a 10 and two. Then you'll get a little bit more of that breakup from the gain knob. Okay, and then um, you can take that even more all the way. So you can turn the volume all the way down and the gain up and you'll have maximum crunchy overdrive, but um, you won't have a lot of clean tone, okay? Hopefully that all makes sense. 
Um, good stuff. Good questions. Man, should have been talking about tone a while ago. But I knew, I was like, man, if I could just incorporate that aux window, I think that could be really cool. Because there's more stuff we can do with it. Another thing I did, which was really cool, was, you remember these? Remember these embossing guns? Let's, I don't know if I got that in focus or not. This thing, and I used to have one of these as a kid, and I loved it. And the original aux prototype had one of those on for the room sound, I think. And I just made one and stuck it on there. So I want to send that picture to James Santiago at Universal Audio. I think he'll get a kick out of that. Um, you're welcome, Ron. Um, Tiny Music Bites wants to know what my favorite fuzz pedals of choice are. It is very tough to decide on a fuzz pedal. But um, a couple things recently I'll, I'll say is there's uh, the Brute by Spiral. I'm typing it. Spiral Electric. That's awesome fuzz. Uh, I don't have it handy. It's on a board over there. Um, that thing sounds incredible. Now, the guy who makes those, his name is Tom Cram. Tom Cram, and he, um, when Digitech a couple years ago started to have kind of resurgence, they would make cool pedals like the Freak Out and the Drop Pedal I've talked about. He was the brains behind that, and um, he went on to, to make his own boutique pedal company, and he sent me that one, man, and it is phenomenal. I'm going to do a video on it for sure. Um, I'm going to sort of as the year progresses, do more like gear-centric stuff that I think you guys want to hear and know about. Um, so I also like the, it's funny, it's, I don't know if they call it the Iridium anymore because Strymon took that name, but Exact Tone Solutions uh, Iridium Fuzz is killer because it's not super fuzzy. I like that one a lot. Um, Adida Rohan Singh says, can you discuss EQ and delay? I sure can. Let me get back to that. Um, Lawrence says he has a love-hate relationship with his Fender Princeton Chorus from the 80s. That was the first amp I ever had was a Fender Princeton Chorus, two tens, and um, it's difficult to get a decent tone out of low volume. It depends on what your tone is. Solid-state amps are tough in general just to get a real natural tone. I would just use the clean sound and kind of turn that one red knob up. Is it a red knob or a black knob? I had a red knob one. Um, and what I would also do is on the gain channel, same thing I told Ron, push the gain button in, turn the gain down and the volume up, and that's going to get you a little bit more of a warmer gain tone. Uh, let's see here. My Vox at 4 is freaking loud. I bet it is. <laughs> um, So Peter Luke says, speaking as someone who never had the opportunity to play through lots of cabinets, how well does the aux emulate the actual sound and feel? That's the best thing about it because the aux isn't emulating it at all. You're still plugging into your amp. So it feels exactly like you're plugging into your amp. And I really noticed that. I mean, I dig, I dig the Iridium. You know, like I bought this on my own because I wanted to check it out and I thought it'd be a cool thing for you guys. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll do a demo at some point on this more in depth. But the aux still beats it for feel because it's still the amp. Just, it's still really good though. It's it's very very good. Um, so it kills. Um, my knees hurt. I'm sorry you're so bored. I'm trying to be as entertaining as possible. Does the aux box also have a volume boost? Kinda. Um, I'll talk about it. Is that an ES330 hanging up behind me? Greg Charbonneau asks. Yes, it is a casino actually. It is a 1961 Epiphone casino. Um, all right. Are you going to do some tone work with a humbucker loaded guitar? Maybe, if we have time. We're, man, we're almost at an hour already, guys. Um, let's see here. Uh, we want to get back to the question about delay. What's the flashing guitar hanging behind me? Um, I think that's probably an acoustic. It's the fan, the ceiling fan. Um, is there something like a stripped down aux you could recommend attenuation only? Um, probably like, I think the Fryette, BV, you could probably jump in on that. Maybe like the Fryette load, they have an attenuator. Um, and there's maybe one from Tone King. Um, that's about it at the most part. Um, I know you, li I, I'd like to know how you use the compression from the aux software when recording with it. 
David, I was going to go into that too. That's David Vistas asked that. And I'll also do EQ and delay. Corey, do you ever sell equipment or pedals? I absolutely do. <laughs> um, I haven't. The thing is, it's kind of a pain in the ass <laughs> to box it up, put it on reverb, get it to the post office. Nowadays, like, we got to support the post office, y'all. I love the post office. I have a couple great ones near me, and um, we got to support them. Go buy some stamps. <laughs> um, let's see here. I'd like to know yeah, <laughs> Is there something stripped down? Okay, we got all that. All right, so let's jump into the Ox app one more time. Um, Christops Minkins asks, how many pedals do I own? I have not counted. <laughs> um, do another tone lesson. I always can. Um, okay, before I answer any more questions and get sidetracked, let's go into the Ox again. And let's talk about, I'm going to turn the reverb down. I'm going to turn the reverb off of the Ox. <laughs> That's just clean. That's what an amp sounds like with no reverb, y'all. That's why we love reverb. You can hear the springs in the Strat, too. Crazy, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to plate reverb. Now, I have to tell you this. The effects in aux don't function like they do in, um, let's say, a, uh, oh, geez, what am I thinking of? Like a pedal. It's not going in front of the amp. In the old days, they would re they would mic an amp and then they would add effects afterwards um, in the studio. And I say old days, they still do it. But in Nashville, so many people record reverb and delay right to the track. Um, so what would happen is a lot of times um, they would add reverb and delay after the fact because it's kind of like like imagine you put icing in the batter of the cake, okay? But we all know that putting icing on the cake afterwards looks and tastes a lot better. That's kind of what happens with effects. Now, uh, technology's come so far nowadays that we don't have to worry about that as much, um, but still, putting effects on after your recorded tone is pretty great. So what you're looking at here is something called a plate reverb. And a plate reverb was a device that lived in a certain part of the studio that they sent signal to and uh, they might they they might that or whatever. Um, <laughs> I don't exactly know how plate reverbs work. Um, actually, they didn't. I've seen plate reverbs that were just like a uh, like a self-contained unit. Um, but there's a plate in there that makes this reverb sound. Um, and they can adjust the plate, and you get different kinds of times and that sort of thing. So if we turn it on, we have a reverb time, and that is the the time is how long it takes the reverb to decay or to stop. So if it's really short, like this, it's on and off very quickly. But if we make it really large, it lasts for a really long time, okay? Now you don't want to play this with a long reverb. You start to lose definition in what you're playing, so we bring that reverb time back down, and now we have... And it's kind of complementing and making the tone a little bit bigger. So we can do that. It's pretty nice, right? So what we can also do is the mix determines how much uh, is the dry signal, which is just our guitar, or the wet signal, which is the reverb. So that's all you're hearing is reverb. So this blends in between the two. And then there's actually EQs on it, so you can you can attenuate the the equalization. You can send it to different different uh, sides of your mix. Um, you can take low frequencies out of it. Lots of times I like to do that. I'll leave it on 90. And then pre delay is fun. So this is kind of like a Jimmy Page thing, for instance, where you play and then the delay happens after, or the reverb happens after you play. It doesn't happen immediately. If it were zero, it plays right with us. If I turn it up, it's going to happen slightly after. And that can be kind of fun if we're like, um, yeah, maybe too much. Or you'll hear like, um, or 
there's a preset in Ox that actually replicates that. Because what's happening is like you're getting a, oh, you guys didn't have my, uh, there we go. Sorry, I was, I just wanted to show you that. I was looking at the wrong screen. I'm a dummy. Um, so when you're playing that, that sound like that, and you have that reverb cranked, it kind of almost gives you like a percussive thing. Okay? All right, so that's reverb. We're gonna take that down a little bit. So, what we're, so we'll add some reverb to the equation. Here. Let's dial it up a little bit. So what I like to do is have a longer time, but a, sh but a drier mix. So it's nice and sort of pillowy there, but I also hear it delaying and decaying. Yeah, okay, so maybe I want a little EQ. And what I'm gonna do is on my guitar, I'm gonna go over to this low cut, and this is gonna take out everything from a certain frequency down. So if I turn it all the way up, you're gonna hear me lose a lot of low end. Took all my low end out. But I'm gonna bring it back to like 125. And this is gonna get some of the mud out of the guitar tone. And this is something I do with recording a lot because it automatically, the, the engineer is gonna do this later anyway. So if I can help them out, I certainly like to do it. So to me, what I also like to do, here's a fun trick, is we'll go over to this view, and you can see that's all the frequencies I took out right there. I'm gonna take this mid-range here, this low mid, and drag it around, I'm gonna play a chord. I don't like that, so I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make it sort of narrow, and then I'm gonna pull it. Now I might want to bring a little back in. And here it is without that. But maybe I want a little boost up around here. So maybe I'll do that. So what's happening is as I play around with that EQ, it's kind of making it a little more mix ready. And it's taking that real woofiness out of it. There's the woofiness, take it out. There's even another one here somewhere. I can't find it. I can go back to this thing. Now watch when I turn it off. It's a lot less defined without it. So that's what EQ can help you do. There's, a, there's, always, there's always more than one way to kind of skin that cat. So there's that EQ, we'll turn it on. Actually, let's turn it off. Hear that low end come back? Doesn't necessarily mean it's good. All right, so now, Let's go over, I hope you guys are digging this. We're in in an hour, but we're gonna go long today since uh, this is a fun topic. And uh, I missed you guys last week. Yeah, absolutely. Guys and gals, because I know Madge is here. She might've left, but if you did, thank you so much for being here. So we got our, uh, well, we didn't turn our EQ back on. Let's go to our compressor. Now what's happening here is this compressor is, um, what it's, do, it's at the end of the signal chain, and it's kind of taking everything that we play with it, it's actually before the delay and the reverb, 
and it's kind of squeezing your guitar tone. It's making it sort of nice and compact, you know? And sometimes we don't want that, and sometimes we do. And what's nice about it is a compressor brings up the frequencies that you play softly and brings down the ones that you play loudly or quietly or aggressively and kind of compresses them. It literally does that. And compressors have um, a sensitivity or an attack. Um, well, a, a, they have an attack time and they have an, a, re a release time. And what that means is how fast does the compressor say, oh, there's signal coming in here. I need to react. Sometimes it can be very quick or very slow. And the release time does the same thing the opposite way. It says, okay, I'm going to take my time letting that signal go, or I'm going to quickly let it go. And then you have sort of an input, which is the amount of compression, and then the output, which is something called the makeup gain. Because every time as you compress, it brings your volume down, so you got to really make it up with the makeup gain. Um, and then the ratio buttons, uh, I'm not going to describe this as good as an audio engineer, but it is um, generally like a four to one compression or an eight to one compression, and it's that's how many times your uh, initial signal it's compressing. So let's go to a compressor, and we're gonna turn it on, and watch the needle move a little bit. So what it did was it even took my pick attack and kind of brought that to the forefront a little bit more, which is kind of nice. And a real common setting for a compressor like this is like a 10 and 2. So when I play, watch the needle react. And it's reacting pretty quickly. If I put it all the way to 1, it's going to react super fast. If I take it to 7, actually, I had it backwards. I always forget with this one. <laughs> But watch how long it, it dies down. That's the release knob here. If I bring that down. Oh, it's taking a while. Now if I bring it back up, it falls faster. So in my experience, I've kind of done this before. And what I want you to listen for is, so if I play, I'm gonna really get a nice, like, sort of modern country type of sound. What I what I use um, compression for is if I have to hold out a long chord, I want that chord to sustain for a while and still kind of maintain its integrity. So I'll do it like like you can hear it's hanging on to it because the power button's on. But if I do this. I can feel it starting to die already. And it's a feel thing. If I put it back, that's maybe even a little too compressed for my liking, because I like very little. But I like compression because I like the way it kind of responds to me. Got a lot of reverb there. Let's turn that down. Dig it. Yeah. So that's sort of like a loose sort of guitar compression. All right, so hopefully that answers some questions. Now what you could do, one last thing somebody asked, now you can plug a foot switch in the aux, and something that's cool is you could take the compressor and you could kind of not really do a whole lot of compression and make it a boost. See, I'm kind of boost using it there as a boost. I didn't want to get too wild on you guys there, but um, that's one way. You could also do that with the EQ. Like you could jump over and you could say, let's do this. Go to like 8K ish as a lead boost. Of course, you want to bring back in your uh, you know your low end. Because 
because not only you're you're changing the frequency, but you're changing the gain. <laughs> That's essentially what a tube screamer does. A tube screamer pokes that mid-range frequency and makes you stick out a little bit more with some adjustability. I mean, I'm, I'm going through it pretty quickly here for you guys, but we could really dial it in and make it sound great. Um, yeah, so let me get back to the chat, talk to you guys for a minute. You're welcome, David. Um, hey, Ronnie, good to have you here. See a bunch of new people. Um, Brian K uh, Canavan says that this is gold. You guys are awesome. Um, and we had somewhere around, oh man, um, 150-ish people today. That was great. Um, let's see what else. Oh, good to have Susie Wheeler back. Thanks, Susie. Um, Ron's going to jump back into this. Solved his effects pedal problem. Sold all of them. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love it. Um, can you control the aux with an iPad? You absolutely can. Um, yeah, thanks, BV, for jumping in there and talking about the power um, power station uh, from Fryat. I know that's a good one. Big fan of the dotted eighth delay, but it can be a wild horse to control. So before we do that, before we talk about delay or anything, let's jump into uh, a couple presets. But I want to talk to um, a couple more people here. Uh, let's see. Was the Fender Super Champ tube amp made in 78 a good amp? I heard that they were kind of a, a sleeper, but I don't really know much about them. So it's, uh, I was pretty young when that amp came out. Oh, give them more of my age away. Corey, could you exp explain, explain in more detail what the concept of an amp breaks up means? Uh, how, when do we get it and how? So earlier, what we talked about is an amp breaks up because the, um, gosh, I'm, I'm not an amp tech, so I'm not gonna be able to say it, but in a typical tube amp, as you turn your volume up with a one channel tube amp, you are, you're pushing those tubes into a place to where they're distorting and compressing and giving you more, um, probably more like plate voltage, they would call it. And that's the sound of like a distortion that we've come to know. As you roll the volume back to like, I'm on three and a half here, it's much cleaner. So here's another tip, like lower wattage amps break up faster than um, higher wattage amps. That's why this one sounds, you know, the way it does th through this through the circle there, because it's a small watt wattage amp, I can really dial it and peg it pretty quickly. Um, and that's kind of a nice thing, like we were talking about the Fender Blues Junior, that's a tube amplifier that you can, um, it's, a, it's a relatively inexpensive one as far as tube amps go, and you can, um, you can drive it into distortion with a master volume. So what happens is you turn that master volume down, the volume up, and you start to drive that amp into uh, into its breakup or its compression. Um, there's a lot of, lot more to talk about on that for sure. Um, Martin Diehouse says, do I have a preference for higher or low output pickups? Generally low output for sure. Um, that's from my taste. Have I tried any Benson amps? No, I've always wanted to. Um, I've seen them around for sure. Let's see here. Thanks, Marco. Appreciate you saying that. Um, thanks, Blue Boy. Appreciate you being here. Um, and BB Ninja's right about the compressor at the end of the chain. Um, in the beginning, I, I use them front and back sometimes. Just depends on um, what I you know what I need. So here's something fun, and I'll close with this. So Ox has. Um, these presets that are designed, and the whole concept is that um, you know our favorite guitar tones were made with an amplifier, speakers, and room sound. Uh, another thing Ox does is it simulates room sound. So what I'm going to do, and we've done that with the Strymon, um, but here the room sound is when you mic the room. You're actually putting a microphone in the room. So it's got some distance attached to it. When you add that into your mic'd up sound,
it's got a real nice fullness to it. And I kind of like to blend it so you almost can't even tell it's happening. But let's get a little bit of a more of a little gainier sound. And we'll go through some of the presets. Um, let's see here. Um, so the song All Right Now. Yeah, let me change the guitar real quick and uh, we'll try to grab a humbucker here, something with a little bit more ops, more options. Oh, sorry guys. I knew I knew we'd get here at some point. My SG is in the is in the shop. My SG is in the shop, and uh, I'm gonna put some new pickups in that. It's gonna be cool. So let's turn this back up. So what you can hear immediately in this sort of free all right now Listen, look at that room sound. It's cranked, right? Really cranked. I can't play cover tunes very well. I wish I my idea was to learn all these that are in here. Um because it's really fun. Um, some some stones type of thing. What happens here, again, so what we're doing is just kind of, as you change the preset, it changes the microphone, it changes the room sound. So it's got big rooms or brown sugar room slap. I have to tune my guitar to G for that. We could go to another one that's kind of fun. Um, I used to know how to play this song, Brass and Pocket. Like that that one's kind of fun um, it's got some chorus in it we could go back to that uh, let's see here I gotta learn these songs someday I will um, oh here's a good one so ACDC have a drink on me mind you we're just using a Princeton okay we're not using a Marshall and this is really cool because you know, um, everybody assumes ACDC, you know, wouldn't use a large diaphragm style mic or room sound. You know, they think it would be like some other sort of rock miking technique. But as we kind of look at this preset, You'll say to yourself like okay well I don't want to do that like why do I need that but that's a good tone and we might pull the room sound back do this, and play around with what it's got it's gonna get loud now we got this killer sound from a Princeton from the have a drink on me preset. You know, it's kind of fun. Um, there's a highway to hell. Let's do that. And look, there's that plate reverb. I bet you it's got some pre-delay, a little bit. Yeah, 
lots of fun. Let's see what else we got. Um... <laughs> Now you're saying, oh, where's that flange coming from? Well, if you go in the delay setting, what happens is um, flange, chorus, that sort of thing is all delay. And it's delay with modulation and short delay times, all that kind of stuff. Um, here's a fun one, just got paid. Lots of room sound in this one. Ah. Love that one, that one's pretty cool. Again, these are just speakers and microphones. That's it, that is it. Um, let's see here. Crazy Train. <laughs> It's kind of bassy, but it gets me in the ballpark. Again, it's a little Princeton that we're using. Um, let's see. If I had my Marshall, it would really be cool. Uh, here's our delay right here. Yeah, let's do that. Let's get a little cleaner sound. We'll back off the... clean it up on the amp. So what I'm doing there is, what I'm doing is just kind of turning the amp down. And what's happening is we're using delay, to dual delay, 504 milliseconds on one side. So it's gone. If I just play quarter notes, I'm getting that sort of... So what you're saying is, well, I don't want to play that song. Yeah, but you might want to oh, mix the cabinet up, go back to something like that, change a microphone, you know, change your amp sound, and create your own thing. Anything. I don't, I don't know. I mean, you might just want to use them as a starting point, which could be really cool. Um, this is a great sort of Keith Richards type one right here. It's called Take It So Hard. Remember that band he had, The Expensive Winos? Killer, killer band. And you can hear how those smaller ones sort of like interact better with this amplifier because it's kind of like the right prescription eyeglasses, you know? Pretty cool. Um, oh, here's a good one. I love this one with the Marshall. Check this out. This is Tie Your Mother Down. This is like the Queen. And if you look at it, it's a ton of room sound. that. That's one of my favorite ones recently. Let me try one more. Um, the Hendrix one. Where's the Hendrix? Wing Cry Solo. So what's really cool about this, this one has a lot of compression because as rumor has it, the um, Hendrix played the solo for this while, the, while he was singing the lead vocal and guitar tone was coming through his vocal mic and you know, and really compressing. Let's get a clean sound. Let's maybe go back to the Strat. The DGT's strings are going out on me. All right, so let me uh, pull the line out volume down. So much to do, guys, it's crazy. All right, okay. I learn all these and then I forget them. Doing all 
kind of stuff just sounds killer. Sorry if I'm shaking the camera there. Because um, he's so compressed. I mean, if we just look at that. Uh, where's it at? Oh, I went away. There we go. Very compressed tone. But you don't know it when you're listening to it. I love it. That's like my favorite one. I also like... There's a Lenny, I can't remember where it's at, probably under L. <laughs> uh, let's see if it's there. It maybe says, maybe it's under SRV. Texas Lenny, there it is. This one's good. You know, um. I'm wearing a damn shirt, I don't remember. I'm so sorry, Steve, for desecrating your song on um, on your birthday, on your, not birthday, the uh, celebration of your death, unfortunately. We lost Stevie Ray 30 years ago. Here we are. Man, I'm just butchering his damn song. But I've played all these before. Ah, uh, was it? I knew I'd find it. Thank you, Stevie. There it is. Ah. Something like that. Anyway, sorry guys. I'm just having some fun. Anyway, there you have it. Let's, um, I should have had, uh, should have had that camera on while I was butchering that song. But see how fast that takes us to. It's so fun. All right. So, guys, it's been an hour and 20. You all have been great. 130 some strong. This is so cool. Great to see everybody. I'll just send some last wishes while while I'm still here. Um, let's see here. Uh, thanks, Lawrence. Appreciate you being here. Uh, Corey will come up on the right of the screen view. Thanks, BB Ninja, for helping out with the um, the tip stuff. Thank you guys for tipping. The um, I can message you back on Venmo, but I can't do it on PayPal. Um, so thanks so much if you pay on PayPal in advance. That is so cool of you. Um, uh, let's see here. He wish he would have bought one of these at the lockdown. They're fun, um, for sure. Please do Skydog. I missed it. Skydog's one of my favorites. It works great with the Ox and with the or with the Two Rock and the Marshall. Um, and thank you, BB, for uh, answering David's question there about the 500 watt switch. Um, you're right that the riff is two guitars, Ken. Um, it's just more of the ballpark there for sure. That's what makes it sound so cool. Um, yes, uh, SFKIM Rush, this will be available later. Absolutely. Any experience with lace sensors? Not in a long time. They were really, really, I mean, they were pretty good. Um, um, but, uh, I like sort of the more traditional lower output things. They were meant for to really just be quiet in one way. Um, let's see here. That's about it, guys. There's lots of stuff coming. It's got a beginner course coming out. Got a uh, got an intermediate rhythm course coming out. Got um, another course with Brett Papa coming out. All kinds of stuff. This this year is going to be good. Um, as much as it was a drag for. Um, my, my peers and the touring industry, um, I doubled down and, and decided to really do this for you got with you guys and for y'all and um, it's it's going to be every, every week's different every, every we got to just pivot and as a musician and somebody who's self-employed um, 
I'm always looking to kind of do the next thing. And thankfully, I have some great friends at some great companies that have really been helping me out and giving me some work. It's been really fun. And you all have been awesome, and I appreciate you being here every week, as long as I am. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, and Susie asked, what's up for next week? I'm afraid I don't know. <laughs> I usually figure it out like a day or two before. Um, maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll work on the lesson. I didn't even get to the lesson I prepared for you guys. But there is a lesson in there for some, um, for some sixths. <laughs> We'll get to that. All right, so that'll be that'll be something we can work on maybe for next week. Um, Rex has a two rock burn side, a little bit like the Princeton. Um, oh man, you got to do it with the ox. So fun. Um, lots of positives come from this crisis. You're oh, you say I'm one. Thank you so much, Jason. You've been very such a great supporter, loyal supporter. Um, thanks, Adrian. Appreciate you saying that. All right, David. I'm glad he's enjoyed today. I'm going to sign off, guys. We had a great stream. I think um, refreshing it right before we go on has been the, the trick. So as soon as that timer runs out, I refresh it. I also have, I have a hard line and the Wi-Fi going at the same time. So maybe there's like some kind of Wi-Fi fairies that are helping me out here too. All right, everybody. I'm starting to lose the voice. I'm going to jump. So good to see everybody. Thanks so much. Pay attention to the uh, the links that BB's sending. Thank you, BB Ninja, and everybody for being here. And um, I, uh, I will not go mow my lawn, Jim. <laughs> Get off my back for that. Anyway, all right, guys, you're the best. Um, come back and watch. If you have any questions, you know where to find me. And uh, see you all soon. See you next week.